Good morning, uh, everyone. Today, I'll thank uh, Miss Hannah Dudley for our uh, background picture. Uh, as I said, after I complained that I don't have enough pictures, you actually came through and have drowned me with a lot of potential options. So if you send me a background photo, I promise it will be on the screen at some point in the upcoming lectures. Um, let me put my screen, my slide on the screen. Today we'll begin talking about a new topic, a deterrence and related components. Um, we are already in lecture 20, as you can see, which is pretty amazing considering the fact that the semester ends in about 10 more lectures, even less. So, um, before I begin uh, the regular uh, structure of the lectures uh, today, I wanna talk about a couple of issues. First of all, regarding your attendance, I know it's a busy time and you have a lot of requirements also from other courses. And some, some of you are here, some of you are not here. You have a lot in your mind. Uh, I do encourage you to try and not lag too far behind from the uh, posted lectures. Also, don't forget to submit the attendance word if you watched the video and did not submit the attendance word for me. I, I cannot tell if you watched or not and then you're just gonna be missing those points. So. Uh, try and do that as much as you can. If you lose track on where you are or how many lectures you've missed, you can uh, come and talk to me about it. I will, starting from today on Tuesday, as well as Thursday in every future office hours, you can just log in and come and ask me. I will be able to provide you exactly which videos you have missed and did not send me attendance word, which videos you're fine with. I do ask that if you wanna uh, figure out this information, come log into office hours and talk about it. Don't send me an email. I don't have time to sit down and write now 65 emails to all of you, letting you exactly which one of those videos you missed. So again, if you wanna know where you are, just log on uh, to office hours. It shouldn't take more than two or three minutes uh, while we do that and we, as we're talking. Uh, the second point is the final paper. I, I will have a more extended discussion and uh, regarding the final paper at some point next week. But one question that I keep getting over email over the last couple of weeks regarding uh, something you may have missed uh, on the syllabus or you just don't remember, you can write the paper in a group of up to three students or you can write it by yourself. Both of these options are possible. Uh, so again, it's your choice. I understand that one of the limitations that you're facing now is that because we're not um, meeting face to face, then you some may not know your classmates, which I understand it's a problem. So uh, I will try to come up with some idea of trying to help you how to know each other. Maybe you'll be able to find uh, people to work with. I cannot force you to work in groups. I cannot set teams, not at that point of this, in this point of the semester. But I hope that by Thursday, I will have some idea to how we may be able to overcome that problem. I can't promise anything. And the last thing is some of you asked to know about the uh, grades from your uh, survey task. So uh, grades from task one, two, and three are uploaded already uh, to eCampus. Uh, they are ranked, of course, on a scale of one to five. If you get five points, you means you got all the points you did the survey properly. If you did less, it's mostly because uh, it appears to me that you have uh, rushed through it, and I'm not exaggerating. Those of you that lost points mostly were those of you that finished your surveys in about a minute and a half. Now, it may not take may not take 10 minutes to finish those surveys that you did last week and the week before and we did, you did before that. Maybe it's gonna take you six, seven minutes. But if somebody answers me a set of questions and returns this survey with about 90 seconds after they started, I'm pretty certain that they didn't read enough of the paper. So that's regarding those things. Okay, uh, a quick review before we go into the new topic. I'll do a quick review as usual on a Thursday. So I finished the discussion about audience cost, talking about mostly about the public angle of audience cost. Uh, I showed you evidence starting from the Tom's paper and then your survey result, replicating results that citizens, members of the public, yourselves care about uh, empty threats. They care more about empty threats even than just staying out of the conflict. Uh, after we began with establishing that basic uh, guideline, uh, that, that baseline of, uh, of results, we, dig, we went a little deeper into the concept of audience cost and the different elements that are involved. For example, how does elite consensus matters? And we saw that in the Lewandowski and Horowitz paper. Uh, 
and then the idea of justification with new information. If the leader is able to provide new information to justify the decision to back down and not going to the conflict or not going to the conflict, how does it matter? And in your own replication, we saw that it matters. And then we talked about two additional concepts, the idea of backing in, which means it's another element of its consistency or another type of breaking a promise, because in that case, the leader promised to stay out and eventually decided to intervene. So how does that matter for the approval of that leader? And then when I talked about the Brodger and Kurtzer paper, the last paper we talked about, the distinction between inconsistency cost, which is making a promise and backing, and backing away, and backing down after making a promise, or uh, the idea of belligerence cost, which is the initial decision to intervene in the first place that some members of the public care about and don't want to intervene in the first place. So they, uh, they disapprove the leader because of that. So that was the different elements. As I told you, audience cost is a very, very wide uh, theory, which there's a lot of work on that. If you're interested in that, also for your final paper, you're more than welcome to come and talk to me. And if you have any questions, as always, uh, you're welcome to email me or come to office hours, as I said. All right, so this week's topic is power, deterrence, and coercion. We will discuss the concept of power uh, and how it translates to strategies of coercion and deterrence based on both rational as well as psychological approaches and the different elements of those strategies. So in the previous lectures, when we talked about a realist theory and neorealism and rational choice, we talked at length about power and how the realist theories view it as the driver of international interaction and the driver of international behavior. And now I want to focus more about the strategic aspect of it. How do we actually imply, imply, apply, I'm sorry, how do we apply that power in reality? So from a strategy standpoint, the most common use of having a power advantage is through deterrence and coercion. And today we'll talk about the former. We'll start talking about deterrence today. We'll talk about coercion on Thursday. So what is deterrence? Deterrence is the use of threats by one party to convince another party to refrain from initiating some course of action. A threat serves as a deterrent to the extent that it convinces the target not to carry out its intended action because of the cost that it will incur. That's the idea behind a deterrence uh, uh, the definition. And how does deterrent actually take place in reality? In most cases, uh, deterrence refers to threats of a military retaliation against an adversary, which means the application of power. Okay, that's how we translate power into a strategic action. The application of power, so military retaliation against an adversary in an attempt to prevent it from using its own military to promote uh, foreign policy goals. So that's how we actually implement uh, deterrence in reality when we are issuing a threat of retaliating with a military force in order to prevent the adversary from taking its own action using the military force. Overall, uh, in the literature and also in the real world, we uh, describe uh, four different types or scenarios where we use, where deterrence is used. So the first fits to the cluster of direct deterrence. Uh, immediate direct deterrence is intended to prevent an armed attack against my own territory especially when it's a short-term immediate threat. So I want to push an enemy which is right on the border now. So I'm engaging in direct immediate deterrence. General deterrence and direct one is intended to prevent an armed attack against my own territory with the intention of both preventing a short-term crisis. So if there's a crisis now, I want to prevent it now. But I also want to prevent the prospect of military future and military conflict in the future, in the long run. As an example, uh, following the uh, Six-Day War, the 1967 war, which Israel, from a military standpoint at least, uh, have won and took control of the Sinai uh, Peninsula uh, in the south, as well as the Golan Heights in the north, uh, Israel was able to establish a direct general deterrence against the Syrians, preventing the latter from attacking the Golan Heights, which again is the direct general deterrence because they were able to uh, prevent attacks on that own territory in the short term as well as in the long run. Even though you can say that that deterrence has uh, eventually uh, was eroded and the 1973 war is a big dent in that deterrence, but that's a different question. The second cluster of uh, uh, scenarios when it comes to deterrence is what's called extended deterrence. So in this case, we also have an immediate and a general one. So an immediate extended deterrence uh, 
is the uh, attempt to prevent an armed attack against the territory of another state. So the direct was against my own territory and extended deterrence means the prevention of an attack against territory of another state. Uh, and the, the immediate one, of course, focusing on the short term, a lot of those examples of uh, extended deterrence in the short term are focusing on major power. So from data that was collected about uh, deterrence displays or deterrent threats uh, from the late 19th century all the way to 1984, mostly comprised of major powers. 83% of the cases were major powers. And examples for those kinds of crises are actually examples for failed immediate extended deterrence is the failure of the British and the French to deter Germany before World War I as well as World War II. We can also think about the United States and uh, South Korea that have established an alliance after the Korean War it was intended to prevent an attack from the North. Uh, the other type is the general uh, extended deterrence, and that's preventing an armed attack against, it, against the territory of another state with the intention of both preventing short-term crises as well as potential future, future uh, aggression. And that's where the alliance between the United States and South Korea also fits, because this was intended to prevent an attack by North Korea or by South Korea in the short term as well as in the future. So those are the different types of uh, deterrence that we are uh, talking about. To um, explain or actually measure success of deterrence, we're using both military uh, terms as well as political terms. From a military standpoint, a general deterrent, deterrence is successful if it prevents the uh, leaders of adversaries from issuing threats or preventing them from taking actions that escalate peacetime competition. So while two countries are in peaceful conditions, they may compete from a diplomatic standpoint or from a military standpoint, but as long as we're able to prevent that peacetime competition from escalating into a crisis or a military confrontation that may lead to an all-out war, then from a general deterrent standpoint, that is success. From a military standpoint, for general deterrence, that is success. For uh, immediate deterrence, this is uh, viewed mostly as a situation where a threat has already been issued or a crisis has already emerged. Somebody already issued a threat against us. We're trying to defend ourselves. And we are successful from a military standpoint to deter the rival if we can prevent an outbreak of what can be viewed as an all-out military conflict. So crisis already emerged, but we are able to prevent this crisis to escalate into a full-blown war so this is a successful immediate deterrence from a military standpoint. The other category for uh, measuring success of deterrence is uh, more of political. And in this case, we're focusing on looking at deterrence from the negative angle of failure to deterrence. So a failure of deterrence happens if a security crisis emerges in the first place. That means from, again, from a political relationship, relationship standpoint, there's already been a failure of deterrence. If a crisis emerges and it escalates the war, also it has, it's another indicator for a failed political deterrence. Lastly, if we choose to uh, prevent conflict or prevent war by offering maximum concessions to the challenger in this case, in most cases those are di diplomatic concessions, but never mind. If we are offering all the concessions possible in order to prevent the conflict, our deterrence failed from a political standpoint because we were unable to prevent it from him just by issuing the threat. So we had to offer all the, po the possible concessions in order to not go into conflict. So that's another measure of deterrence in this case. Uh, from a theoretical standpoint, the theory of deterrence highly relies on the logic of the rational choice model. Again, the assessment of cost and benefit and how that leads to certain choices. So leaders who consider the use of force facing a deterrent threat, they will have to compare the expected utility from using force with the expected utility from refraining from a military challenge in the status quo. And if we are able to, uh, and this assessment will decide whether deterrence is successful or not. The rational aspect of deterrence relate to how do military threats can reduce the expected utility of using force by persuading the attacker that engaging in such an action will be both costly as well as unsuccessful. 
So we want to think about what is an effective deterrence from that standpoint. An effective deterrent are threats that decrease the expected utility of using force, but at the same time, they do not reduce the expected utility of staying in the status quo. From an optimal standpoint, deterrent policies would even increase the expected utility of not using force. So it's going to be better for my rival if I'm actor A and I'm issuing a deterrent threat versus actor B. It, I'm going to, the, the most effective deterrent threat is I'm able to show to that actor that it's going to be better for him or her to stay in the status quo than engaging in a, a military conflict. Now, one of the side elements of this entire dynamic, when you think about it from a utility standpoint or a, issuing those kinds of threats, is that a deterrent threat may create incentives for a preemptive attack. A deterrent threat may backlash if it leads the attacker to commence a preemptive attack because that attacker fears that the, de the defender's deterrent threat is only a prelude to an offensive attack. And instead of engaging in all those complicated concepts, let's just take an example of A and B. If A is the defending state and B is the attacker, B will may, may have incentives to engage in a preemptive attack because once A, the defender, issued a deterrent threat, B may think that this deterrent threat by A is only a prelude to a defensive attack. So A has issued a deterrent threat, but A, according to B's perception in this case, may follow through with this deterrent threat and actually go into offensive, uh, offensive attack. So that provides incentives to actor B, which was the attacker in the first place, to actually go into a preemptive attack. And I'm gonna expand a little, bit, a little bit about that aspect uh, in a few minutes. All right, uh, talk a little bit more about uh, how do we estimate or how do we measure a successful deterrent threats. So the success of a, de a deterrent threat is highly contingent on that threat being credible. The deterring, the deterring actor in this case must have the military capabilities to inflict substantial cost. In addition, the attacker must be convinced that the defender is resolved in taking action of the threat. So if the defender issued a threat, the, he, he has to convince the attacker that he's gonna fall through and not back down. And we're gonna talk about resolve more in, uh, later in, this, in today's lecture, but this is an important part of making deterrence into a credible threat. Okay, so one of the problems when it comes to uh, issuing a credible threat or a credible deterring threat is that every defending state has incentives to issue uh, threats or to portray itself as resolve, right? We talked about the importance that appearing resolve is important in order for the threat to be credible, but every state that wants to defend itself has incentives to portray itself that way in order to prevent attacks, right? So if everybody has those incentives to appear resolved, how can we distinguish between a defender that issues a credible threat to a defender which only issues a bluff in this case? So the answer to that question is that the resolved states have to display a costly signal. Oh, there you go. Um, I've talked about costly signals already in previous lecture. We're going to talk about it a little bit more. It's one of the most essential components of uh, behavioral theories in the context of IR. And costly signals refer to actions and statements that clearly increase the risk of a military conflict. They also increase the cost of backing down from a deterrent threat. And as a result, they actually reveal the true intentions behind the threat. They reveal information about the actual commitment of a defending state to follow through and defend itself against an attack. That means that if we want to distinguish between a true credible threat and a bluff, a bluffing, a state which bluffs and does not offer a, a credible deterrent threat is not willing to cross that threshold and commit itself to what stands behind this kind of threat. Because if this kind of state says, we will send the military forces, maybe they will not actually do that. So that's how we know it's a bluff. A, a credible signal, a credible threat will use cost and signals to show that. Now, this may sound simple, but issuing a credible threat through a costly signal, such as 
sending troops to the border involves risks of its own. The main one is the security dilemma, which reminding you again, this is a concept we talked about when we talked about realism and neorealism, may induce defenders to be cautious with the types of signals, the type of actions that they use because they want to prevent a preemptive attack. Remind, I reminded you that I talked about it earlier, that one of the risks of a credible uh, deterrent threat is creating incentives for a preemptive attack, and that's where it, exactly it comes into play. If I'm gonna use a costly signal, a very strong one, I may create incentives for my adversary. I'm trying just to prevent an attack on him, but actually I may create incentives for him to issue, to engage in a preemptive attack. And we have to think about different aspects of that. That's related to the domestic politics and the support for the threat. How much support do I have to my own types of signal that I'm sending, whether the public actually supports me. I talked about audience cost. We have to think about unintended cost actions by allies. So if, if I'm issuing a threat and also I want to issue a costly signal to make sure that the threat is, sig is credible, what is the possibility that some of my allies will actually take some actions that are going to harm my whole intention behind that uh, deterrent action. And lastly, is from a strategic standpoint, there's, there can be concerns that a rigid response, a rigid or very strong uh, costly signal will generate high political cost for my adversary who will not be able to back down. Think about that. If I'm now country A, I'm an autocracy. And my adversary in this case, country B, is a democracy. Maybe I will send too strong of a cost of signal that that will create incentives that's gonna be so hard for my adversary to back down also because he's a democracy. And that's gonna be a problem for me that might uh, create incentives for that adversary to go into a preemptive attack mode. Uh, one way to solve uh, those concerns is to send signals which are balanced. The balance between credibility and stability of uh, the situation those include different policies that rely on reciprocity and conditional cooperations, and, and therefore they are more likely to achieve the goals of actually, on the one hand, showing a credible threat, do not go into keep, a, a keep with your forces away from my border, but at the same time, not provoke my adversary into a preemptive attack. You can think about that as a gradual a withdrawal of forces, you would withdraw your naval uh, forces from my, uh, from my water and I will withdraw my air force, all kinds of actions that are based on reciprocity. You will take action, I will take action in response and everything is conditional on kind of cooperation between both sides is intended to diffuse these kind of situations. So um, this is uh, the uh, basic introduction of deterrence theory. And now for the next uh, section, I want to uh, focus on, for the remainder of the, today's lecture, we're going to talk about two topics which are central into the uh, a formation of, uh, into the generated deterrence and into the formation of uh, uh, this theory. And those are reputation and, and resolve. And we'll begin with reputation and how, how much does it affect uh, security conflicts mostly. So first of all, reputation is one of the fundamental aspects of deterrence, right? Uh, in terms of what is reputation, because it's not necessarily uh, clear to us what is that mean. It's, it's very easy to invoke that concept, but defining it, what reputation actually means. So the reputation refers to the perception of rivals regarding the state's willingness to risk war with, this act, with, with its actions. And because talk may be cheap, because as I said, when I talked about uh, credible uh, threats and cost of signals, everybody can issue a threat. But in order to ensure that that creates or generates a specific reputation, that means that depends on what I do, on my actions. That's the basic arguments of viewing reputation. Now, uh, the number one question uh, that we can think about in the context of reputation is, does reputation really matter for the way that states behave in the international context? And there's a lot of evidence in this case which actually points to multiple directions. Uh, a lot of empirical evidence which is based on case studies suggests that reputation is uh, not a critical factor that shapes behavior. A case studies of uh, interactions between the United States and the Soviets during the Cold War show that uh, expectations regarding the behavior 
were almost never based on past behavior. And that suggests that the way that uh, leaders of countries uh, generate those expectations are mostly focusing on situational factors and there are better predictors of behavior than reputation. At the same time, there is some evidence that suggests that adopting a conciliatory, conciliatory uh, stance increases the odds of facing more threats in the future. So that means that deterrence as well as reputation is one of the important elements to create deterrence do have an effect, right? So that's another type of evidence. Now, overall, uh, uh, other arguments that uh, some scholars have suggested is a more, in a more general sense is that in most conflict situations, in most conflict scenarios, leaders tend to focus on new information from the crisis itself. So that's like this uh, situational factors argument from here. However, that argument, that last argument that I'm talking about here, does not ignore reputation overall. It, uh, the, the, the main point of that argument is that past actions, the reputation, the way we see that, is already incorporated into those leaders' viewpoint. So when leaders are walking into a crisis, they already have into their, in their uh, view some form of idea of what is the reputation of that country that they're facing crisis. And their focus for this specific uh, a crisis is uh, situational factors such as military power or the issues at stake. That's the point. So that means that reputation do have an effect but they mostly have an effect on a general view in terms of general deterrence. And as an example, I want to talk about the Falkland Wars. So uh, the Falkland Wars is a military confrontation between Argentina and the United Kingdom. It took place in uh, 1982. In early April, April 2nd, 1982, uh, the Argentinians invaded into the islands, the islands of Falklands and South Georgia, which are on the South uh, Atlantic Ocean, not, far, not that far away from the uh, eastern uh, coast of Argentina. Argentina, I'm sorry. Um, in the context of our discussion about reputation, the decision by the Argentinian uh, government in this case, which was led by the dictatorship, the military dictatorship in Argentina at the time, was based on how they view the British reputation when it comes to uh, military crises, especially in territories that they had control from the old days of the uh, uh, the, back from the, uh, from the early uh, 19th century. Uh, the Argentinians in this case looked at prior confrontations in which uh, the British did not appear to be resolved in their response. And their main example, the main analogy for that were uh, the way that the British reacted in the Suez crisis. Uh, so the British in this case had uh, a general view of negative or bad reputation in terms of how they're viewed and how they're going to respond to a challenge on a territory under their control uh, in, this, uh, in this time. And also, because as I said, it's not just reputation, it's also the situational conditions. So the Argentinians in the context of the Falkland uh, Islands uh, faced favorable conditions because the islands were weakly and defended by the British uh, military. It was thousands of miles away from home and it was much closer, of course, to uh, the mainland and Argentina. So again, both of those things work together to provide incentives for the Argentinians who's been for, who were for many, many years uh, fighting to take uh, control back from the uh, British over that area. So uh, that was some of the motivation. So that's how we see how reputation in the past uh, has uh, shaped the behavior of the Argentinians, the reputations of the British. Now, in reality, uh, the invasion by the Argentinians was in April 2nd of 82. By April 5th, the British government have already uh, sent a very uh, substantial naval and air force uh, task force to uh, uh, the South Atlantic in order to recapture the island. It took about uh, 10 weeks. It involved high price in blood and military hardware. The British lost a lot of uh, military vessels at the time, the Argentinians as well. But eventually uh, the British uh, retook control by uh, uh, the middle of June of 1982. The British ret retook uh, control over the island and pushed the Argentinians away. So they had substantial loss when it comes to uh, uh, the conflict itself, but they had substantial gain in terms of reputation as well as deterrence for future events. So this is an example in this case for uh, the um, 
the effect of information related to the conflict itself and how that shapes uh, perceptions of uh, reputation as well as uh, past behavior. All right, so uh, overall, there are three approaches to consider how does reputation has an effect on deterrence. First is what's termed strong interdependence of commitment, which uh, means that past behavior in international crises it creates strong beliefs for the attacker about the expected behavior for the defender, which means, again, that deterrence credibility is linked over time. Um, you can think about that as the way that the Argentinians view the British, the way that the British behaved in the past regarding their uh, territories. Also, over time, is the same expected behavior that will be in the future. That provides incentives for the Argentinians to recapture the island. The problem for this uh, approach is that uh, it does not clearly describe how and why this kind of uh, interdependence work, and it also ignores uh, contextual factors. A second approach is what's called case-specific credibility. Reputations, according to that uh, approach, have a very limited effect, and the credibility is mostly linked to specific contextual factors, such as military balance or the interest at stake. So that means that prior conflict behavior have little role in the current crises. And the third approach, as always, is somewhere in the middle, and it's called qualified interdependence of commitments. That means that reputations from past behavior uh, do have an effect, but only under certain conditions. According to that approach, reputations will matter only when the behavior that is observed does not fit with the, expe with the attacker expectations. So for example, let's go back to our example of countries A and B. Remind you, A is the defender, B is the attacker. So if the defender, country A, does not use force when the attacker, country B, expects her to, then country B, the attacker, can infer that the defender lacks resolve, uh, has a negative reputation in this case, but not just because of specific uh, conditions related to the conflict, but for more general traits. Now, what this approach uh, actually uh, pushes us towards is that if we want to use that from an analytic standpoint, we need to recognize the expectations and the beliefs of attackers in this case regarding the defender's response, which means that individuals' views of this concept of reputation and deterrence matter. All right. So, as I said, the question of do reputations matter is one of the central questions uh, that uh, we explore from a, a research standpoint. So to do that, we will look at the work of uh, Weisinger and Yarhi Milo. They begin with the uh, argument that I've already placed that there is mixed evidence regarding the effects of reputation. Does past resolve has any effects on future threat? Because if reputations do not, does not matter, then it will have, the fact that it does not matter will have a negative implications for both boot, a bad reputation as well as good reputation, which means that even if you were or displayed resolve in the past, but reputation does not matter, so it means that it not necessarily will prevent from being attacked in the future. That's one side of that. What they suggest to do, one of the suggestions they make is to think about uh, reputation uh, from a strategic perspective using a game theory model which looks at the interactions between two actors. But in this case, it's not just the single interactions, but they suggest to look at that as what's called a repeated interaction. So those two countries that we are thinking about here in our strategic setting are gonna uh, engage in multiple interactions over time. Because we're using this kind of uh, model and those kinds of ideas, we're relying heavily, of course, on rational choice, which means that learning is a critical concept. Remember when I talked about rational choice, one of the important aspects of rational choice was the idea of updating. Updating my uh, behavior based on feedback from the environment. So if I want to pursue goal A, if I keep collecting information from the, from the environment and I'm getting feedback that I'm unable or the behavior that I'm engaged in is not the most efficient to uh, accomplish a goal A, I can either switch and try to go to goal B, or I can just change my behavior. That's the idea behind updating. So that means, again, coming back to our discussion about a reputation, that past actions should matter for establishing of reputation. 
And according to this logic, the more problematic type of past actions is having bad reputation, it means that you're not resolved. Because if you were not, if you did not display resolve in the past, so you created negative reputation for yourselves on past actions, in a subsequent conflict, the attacker will demand more because I acquiesced, I, uh, I uh, relented in the past, so now I generated a bad reputation and the attacker has incentives to actually uh, demand more in conflict that happens now. Also, there's a higher chance of a, a crisis going into a military confrontation because again, the attacker used the feedback from my past behavior, updated his own views, and he learned that me, if I, was, if I have bad reputation, I am more likely to concede in the crisis. So it provides incentives for the attacker in this case to not just demand more, but also use military force if that needs to. All right, so they want to test really this question about the effect of a past reputation on uh, the risks of additional conflicts. So they use data about uh, militarized disputes between 1816 and 2001. They also rely on directed diets. I've already mentioned the concept of uh, the idea of directed diets in previous lectures. It's testing the uh, interaction between two actors in a diet, so one actor against the other in order to account for, their, uh, for the outcome. Their main measure for reputation in this case is the outcome of past conflicts between those actors. And what they're doing is they're using this measure for reputation in order to assess how that reputation, how does a past conflicts between two actors had an effect on being attacked in a subsequent militarized conflict. Uh, so, okay. This is some of the results. What we see here in all those different plots is the marginal effects of the different factors. How do the different factors affect the outcome that we're talking about, and that's the likelihood of being attacked in uh, additional uh, disputes. And we, I want to focus mostly on this one because this is our main question here. It's the effect of reputation, whether reputation has any effect on, uh, on the future uh, conflicts. And what we see here, that higher values on the x-axis, we have different values of bad reputation. So the outcome of past conflicts, in this case, bad reputation is negative outcome higher values on the bad reputation uh, measure increases the probability, which is what we have on the y-axis for all those plots, of being attacked in subsequent conflict. So in this case, what they show essentially is that bad reputation increases the odds of additional challenges. They also show that some of the situational factors also matter. For example, relative capabilities, the higher value here is represented when two actors are relatively close in the military capabilities, so the likelihood of uh, additional conflict is actually lower. And we also see the effect of overall number of recent uh, disputes has an effect. So situational factors also matter, but reputation, which was one of the questions that we started with this part of the discussion, has an effect. Okay, I'm not sure. We had some glitches in the recording. I hope that we are still okay. So I will just reiterate what I was, uh, I just stopped with, unfortunately. Sorry about that. The main findings that uh, they show was the question that we started with bad reputation, negative reputation, past behavior matters for the uh, probability of being a target of future aggression also, in addition to situational factors. Okay, so uh, let's move on. We uh, talked about the importance of reputation in the context of deterrence, but one question we can think about in that context is whose reputation? Is this the leader reputation or the state reputation? With the increase in research over uh, on uh, individuals that I've already talked about over the last couple of years, there's a lot more research when it comes to uh, focusing on individual leaders, on elites. Scholars began to explore this question of, uh, can we study the reputation of specific leaders this, uh, separately from a reputation of a state? Uh, so the main question we're thinking about in this case is how do uh, leaders uh, create their reputation. How do these reputations develop over the length of time or often? Think about the reputation that uh, President Trump has come into. 
when it came into office in, uh, in 2017 and where we're standing today. And I'm not gonna go and talk anymore about uh, the president. It's just not what I wanna talk about now. All right, so uh, to do that, we're gonna use another paper that you had in your reading links for today, the work by Professor Eric Lipton. Uh, Okay, so I'll, I'll apologize once again. I don't know there's kind of a diff technical difficulties with, uh, with the software today. So uh, the focus, I'll take one step backwards to ensure that we have everything. The focus of what we're gonna talk about now is uh, reputations of leaders. How do leaders develop reputation early on? How to develop them during their time in office? So we're using the work from uh, Professor Lipton on that. And we'll begin with the argument that when leaders uh, enters office, and new leaders will enter office, then the adversaries will have an information gap regarding what is the intentions and what is, because there's no reputation with that leader. We don't know that leader beforehand. So there's an information gap regarding the intentions of those leaders. And the leaders will build those reputations through their statements and their behavior upon taking office before taking actual actions to establish their resolve in keeping with their prior statements. So the critical uh, aspect here is the critical signals that are sent early on. Whenever leaders have the first chance early in the tenure when they have a chance to signal their intentions and build their reputations. So the statements uh, issued before taking any kind of actions in order to demonstrate that resolve are the most crucial part in, in the formation of reputation for those leaders. Um, Okay, let's move on. So how do new leaders show their developing reputations over time? So once there's some kind of early, or, uh, early interaction, okay, we keep having those issues today, so it may be a little bit harder to make uh, this uh, lecture, but we will, work through. Okay, so how do new leaders show their developing reputation? When there's early, any kind of earlier interactions, relatively early in the tenure of those new leaders, when they have interactions with other leaders, for example, if they have negotiations in crisis situations, those are critical points when they can demonstrate or communicate their uh, positions of different policies and therefore establish the, like, the baseline of their reputation. This information offers a lot to their adversaries in terms of closing that gap that they already have because they didn't have uh, that information earlier because the, new, the leader was new. So those early interactions between leaders early in the tenure of the new leader provide them the baseline. So how uh, do uh, these early interactions matter for future expectations and actually to the formation of reputations? So first of all, statements, early statements as well as subsequent actions uh, combined together and they create expectations about future behavior. At the same time, the initial perceptions of resolve based on this early interactions between leaders or the early statement that leaders make while they're in office will condition the later assessment of their adversaries, which are complicated, which, make, which makes the, the views of reputation a little bit more complicated because that means if there's any kind of an initial perception about that leader, it's gonna be harder to change that perception. Uh, I wanna give one example that uh, shows those dynamics. And with that, we'll go back to the Cold War and to our friends, former American President John uh, Kennedy, as well as the Russian Premier uh, Khrushchev. And we're gonna talk about it uh, for, for a minute or two in the context of the uh, crises in Berlin and the Bay of Pigs. So um, early on, the Soviet leader Khrushchev here on the right-hand side expected uh, Kennedy to act in a very resolved manner when it came to the Berlin crisis, which began already before uh, Kennedy actually uh, went into office in the late 1950s, but it escalated in the early 1960s. And Khrushchev expected uh, Kennedy to behave in a very uh, more resolved and aggressive manner, 
because he considered the, uh, the latter's early rhetoric on the issue. Kennedy was very uh, aggressive in his rhetoric regarding the issues of Berlin before he entered into office. However, the American response to the crisis in Berlin was relatively weak, and it made Khrushchev less dependent on the, his early impression of Kennedy from those early statements, and he actually began to base his view as in kind of developing the rep, his, reputa his uh, view about the reputation of Kennedy based on his recent actions. So that means that the weak actions when it came to Berlin generated some reputation to Kennedy in the eyes of Khrushchev. The events that surrounded the additional crisis that happened early on during Kennedy's tenure, which was the Bay of Pigs, already uh, further damaged the reputation that Kennedy has developed when it comes to Khrushchev. We can think about that and say that Kennedy developed a pretty negative reputation as an irresolute leader in the eyes of Khrushchev, and that may have contributed on some levels to the events that happened a year later when it came to the Cuban Missile Crisis. If Kennedy had a much stronger, more resolute reputation in the eyes of Khrushchev, maybe he would not place the missiles in Cuba? Possibly, but it's not. We, we, we can't tell that. All right, so uh, the focus of the theory that the author talks about, of course, is the effects of early statements and early action in the established of a reputation and how that develops over time. So to test that theory, she uh, uses a survey experiment with a focusing on a process tracing method. This kind of method allows her to, uh, to test for the formation of the uh, reputation early on and how that may change uh, over uh, multiple uh, interactions. She, ac she accounts for uh, several factors, including uh, the leader uh, statement, as well as uh, the actions and the personal uh, characteristics of the leader. The main measure that she used in order to account for how does a reputation form and then how does it change is how the respondents of the survey view the statements and the actions of the adversarial leaders. So what does she find? First of all, she finds that the early interactions, which is in her experiment was the summit phase, the, the, the way she described it was that the, the interactions between both leaders begins with a summit between them. So the initial interactions, whenever there was a strong statement made in that time, they were very important. A resolute statement make leaders appear more resolved. So that's one finding which supports her theory about the importance of early statements. She also finds that past actions also drive perceptions and also matter for uh, perceptions of reputation and result, and also some evidence about contextual factors. So in order to account for those different elements, I want to show you her, one of the main figures that she has in terms of the result. This is what's called the coefficient plot. It shows the different effects of the different factors that we have here, the different factors. How do they affect the uh, perceived reputation? Remind you again, the way that we can interpret this kind of figure is a uh, Everything, every one of those uh, small effects that does not touch the zero line, this uh, dotted line here, means that the effect is significant from a statistical standpoint and we can have a positive or negative effect. So if you're looking, for example, on state conflict history, it has a negative effect on the negotiation stage, which is the second stage in her process. So past behavior of, this, of the state, not of the, the individual leader in this case, in the past, as a negative effect on the perceived reputation during the negotiation stage. At the same time, leader statements, as I said, are very powerful, especially in the earlier phase of the summit. They also have an effect in later stages. And when it comes to the past actions of the leader itself, then they matter for those effects, for those stages. They have a positive effect on the view of the, uh, the reputation of the leader during both the crisis stage as well as the negotiation stage. Now, because statements and behavior work together, she also accounts for their interaction. That's what we have here also. This is another type of, uh, of a coefficient plot, and we have here the interactions, the statistical interaction between statements and behavior. So we know that when leaders engage in irresolute statements and they also engage in irresolute behavior, it has a negative effect on reputation. It's a pretty strong one. At the same time, irresolute statements followed by resolute behavior actually have a positive effect, but again, a small one in terms of reputation. A resolute statement, which are actually then leading to a, which are then followed by irresolute behavior, we can think about the way that Kennedy behaved in Berlin as an example for this one, has a negative effect of reputation, but a small one, but still negative one. And the most powerful effect when it comes to establishing powerful and strong reputation is providing early strong statements which are resolute and then behaving accordingly. 
Uh, one of the important findings or the contributions of her study is regarding the role that rhetoric plays in foreign policy. She shows that statements are critical in signaling results. And that's in a way that's not in line with a lot of the previous literature, which suggests that the talk is cheap because everybody can issue a, a, credible, a, a threat. But in this case, she shows that even early statements made by leaders matter for the way that they're viewed in the future. She also shows how leaders uh, develop reputations beyond the state. So the leader has its own individual reputation beyond the, the reputation of the state itself. And that early in the tenure, uh, leaders are in the crucial phase of developing those reputations, and those are likely to persist over the duration of their time in office. So it's hard to change your reputations once you establish one early on. Okay, uh, the last section of today, of today is gonna talk about another concept which relates to reputation. Reputation in our, concept, in our context, in our discussion, relates to resolve, which is the expected behavior in conflict. So I wanna talk a little bit more about resolve. In terms of definition, resolve refer to the extent to which a state is willing to risk war in order to achieve its objectives. However, resolve depends on how one actor values the stakes involved and the cost of fighting. Because this is the, the perception of one actor regarding the expected behavior of another actor, that means that maybe we should also view that as an individual disposition. It's not just the strategic situation and how that, how that uh, leads to my expected behavior, it's how I perceive your willingness to uh, risk war and that's how resolve you are. That means that it's also an individual perception. If that's an individual perception, that means that it can vary over time, which relates us a little bit into the arguments that Lockton has made, that on the one hand, early reputations are hard to change, but they can change depending on uh, certain uh, conditions. But it also means that reputations may vary across topics. You may have one type of reputation when it comes to foreign policy or national security, and you have a different type of reputation when it comes to domestic politics. So we're gonna talk about that in the context using the work made by Kurtzer. Uh, what he suggests is we should expand the view of resolve beyond, beyond the uh, strategic element of that into a more, uh, looking at it more as a behavioral aspect. So he uh, links the behavioral definition of resolve using the concept of firmness or uh, steadfastness of her purpose. The idea behind that is that we maintain our behavior despite uh, contrary inclinations or temptations to back down. So there's an emphasis on a determined and a sustained effort to persist in our actions despite temptations to the contrary. And that also relates to, uh, because we're looking at this also from a behavioral standpoint, uh, that also relates to some of the psychological traits such as willpower, self-regulation, and self-control. Now, one of the important questions we can ask about that is that there's also a lot of work before, there's been a lot of work about the issue of resolve. We talked about reputation, it's one of the general and one of the most dominant concepts in the literature. Why do we need to study resolve from more of a dispositional angle? There's a couple, couple of points about that. First of all, it relates to the idea of problems when it comes to observations and measures, and that's where tautology comes into play. The idea behind that is that we want to learn about the effects of resolve, and we do that by looking at the outcomes which resolve is intended to explain. What exactly does that mean? We want to test whether one leader displayed resolve, and that led to some outcome, in this case, the way that that leader behaved in conflict. But we don't know how to measure that resolve. So what we do instead is that we look at the outcome and we infer based on the outcome on the result, which means that we use resolve to explain the outcome and we use the outcome to explain the result and that's tautology. That's one problem based on the fact that it's hard to observe resolve and it's very hard to measure that. So that's one reason, we're, so maybe we should also focus on a dispositional angle. Another point is that, again, it makes more sense uh, to study it also as a dispositional, as a behavior trait uh, because uh, being resolute means that you're persistent. This is a behavioral trait. While resolve uh, represents behavior, we do not have a, a clear sense of where resolve comes from. What are the individual elements that can act as the different mechanisms that lead cause and effect? What are the different individual elements that lead us to be more resolved or re less resolved in other situations? And the final point is that by looking also at the dispositional angle of resolve, we can study this concept in a more interdisciplinary fashion, accounting not just for uh, insights that we have from IR, but also looking at economics and psychological angles. So 
what constitute resolves? Uh, the author proposes that we should use in what's called an interactionist approach, which is an integrated approach accounting for both situational elements as well as individual dispositions. So when it comes to situational elements, he's focusing on the costs of the conflict. In this case, suggesting that, for example, looking at the human cost of conflict, which is a high number of costs, that that should lead to lower uh, degree of result because there's a lot of cost of that. Uh, similarly, when reputational costs are very, very high, that should lead, that's increased the likelihood that the leader will back down, that the leader will be less resolved. That's how the situation condition themselves have an effect on the observed result that we're trying to measure. We are also accounting, as we said, in this approach with uh, individual dispositions, and the focus here are different types of preferences. So time preferences related to how do we estimate, how much do we value the present and the future? So those who place high value on the future, they are more patient, they are more likely to be more resolved because we are placing a lot more value on future outcomes. We're willing to be more resolved in order to accomplish those future outcomes. So that means we're willing to take more, we will be more resolved. When it comes to risk preferences, that's a little bit more complicated and the effect is not linear in this case because we have to balance between the risks of fighting conflict and at the same time, the risk of withdrawing from conflict or backing down from the conflict. Because of that, we are expected to have a more of a nonlinear effect. Uh, to test that uh, framework and to actually assess more directly a result of a, a individuals, he uses an experiment. In this experiment, participants uh, go through multiple iterations of a conflict situation, and they will have to decide when do you want they want to stop the military intervention. So the more a rounds of the conflict that the participant goes through, that means that that participant is more resolved. That's the way that he measures that concept. Uh, and he also accounts for, he provides different information regarding the cost of the conflict in order, to, in order to account for those situational factors, just like we talked about here. And he also uses uh, different surveys in order to measure some of those dispositional uh, factors. So what does he find? So this is again another, uh, type of a coefficient plot to show us the effect of the different factors. What we see here, again, is that uh, the situation matters. So anticipated cost has a negative effect on uh, the measure of resolve in this case, which is saying that the higher the expected cost in a conflict, the level of resolve is low, which is in a way what we expected regarding the situation. But he also shows that the dispositional factors matter. Having uh, low valuations of the future reduces the, like, the uh, extent of resolve that leaders have. Those who focus more on the present have lower resolve in this case. If you want to probe a little bit more the idea of those uh, individual dispositions, we see here those are the different marginal effects of the two types of individual preferences. This is the uh, time preferences, this is the risk preferences. Uh, this is a little small, so I'm sorry about that. But for example, this is the risk aversion one. We see here that higher degree of risk aversion, people who are more concerned about the risks of the conflict actually display lower level of result. Reminding you again, how do we interpret those kinds of uh, figures? We have to look on all the values that do not, uh, do not cross the zero line. All the values of, uh, the, of this uh, set of results, including the confidence intervals, which is the entire gray area here, that do not cross the zero line. In this case, it starts over here. In this case, it starts somewhere over here. That's what we can account as the significant results. So uh, that's what uh, Kurtzus has shown us regarding uh, what constitutes uh, what constitutes a result. So it's not just the situation itself. We should also account for the uh, dispositional angle. So resolve is composed of both situational conditions as well as individual traits or characteristics in this case. Uh, last thing, in order to complete the discussion about uh, resolve and reputation, I want to talk about how do we assess the degree of resolve of others, right? Because as, we, as I talked about in the earlier work, this is also work by Kurtzer, but as I talked about the previous work, he argues that one of the reasons why we need to focus on resolve as a dispositional uh, concept is because it's usually based on our perception, the way that I view the behavior of others, and that leads me to infer about the degree of resolve of others. So uh, in this study, the authors want to focus about uh, how, do, uh, how do we assess the resolve of others 
the basic questions is what are the cues that we use to assess the degree of resolve in others? This is an information type questions. And we need to uh, view that, we can view that as the, this information that we're looking for, we can view that as a set of heuristics that we use to make such judgments. So different types of information elements that we use in order to decide whether this individual that we perceive now, whether this is individual or this a country behaves in a resolved manner or in non-resolved manner. So the authors suggest uh, two general categories to look at, characteristics and behavior. Uh, characteristics relate both to the state characteristics as well as to leader characteristics. When, you go to, when we talk about state characteristics, we talk about, for example, capabilities and stakes, so higher capabilities should lead us to view those actors as more resolved. Similarly, when it comes to regime type, right? If the leaders will, that we are observing now is a leader of a democratic state, we expect that leaders to be more resolved. Why? I talked already in the entire of last week, we talked about the idea of audience cost. And one of the main arguments in the literature was that for democratic countries, they should be uh, more li liable to audience costs. So those leaders should be more resolved because they don't want to lose in a conflict or a crisis because they will pay dearly for that. Uh, in terms of characteristics for the leader, so we can think about uh, in this context, they, I mentioned the idea of military experience. Leaders that have mil past military experience are more resolved. They are familiar with this context. Time in office also matters. New leaders, just like we talked about with the Lupton crisis, uh, Lupton crisis uh, should be more as uh, Lupton paper, I'm sorry. So uh, leaders who are new in office should be more resolved because they need to establish their reputation to how resolved they are. And lastly, they also account for gender, uh, suggesting that male leaders will be viewed as more resolute than female leaders. The second cluster of explanation focuses on types of behavior. So for example, past behavior relates, of course, to reputation. If a leader has backed down in a crisis in the past, he should be viewed as less resolved. When it comes to current uh, behavior, we can focus about everything we talked about earlier when it comes to costly signals. So leaders that are engaged in different types of uh, uh, actions that are some cost or any types of costly action types of actions uh, will increase the level of results. Okay, so before uh, finishing uh, by talking about the results, I will stop for today's attendance word. Today's attendance word is the word sounds. Sounds is attendance word for today. All right, so what do they do? They do what's called a conjoint, a conjoint experiment. A conjoint experiment is a type of experiment which allows to assess multiple factors at the same time. I'll remind you again that when I talked about experimental designs, I told you that one of the main benefits that this kind of method offers us is the ability to identify or to isolate one causal factor and test its effect on our question in this case. So everything is the same. One factor of everything in the situation is different among two uh, respondents. And then we can estimate how does this factor had an effect on the outcome. Now, a conjoint is a different uh, type of experiment in this case because it allows us to assess not one factor, but to assess multiple factor and estimate the effects of each component, the marginal effects of each component has independently on the outcome. In most of those cases, a lot of uh, scholars that use that uh, method, they use different vignettes to describe, and in this context, they describe states in conflict and they vary those different aspects. So the categories I just talked about. I'll, I wanna give you an example of how does that, how does this look like? This is the vignettes that uh, uh, respondents are viewing in this uh, conjoint design. So you see there's two countries here. On the left-hand side, you see the different factors that I talked about, uh, whether it is the behavior, whether it's the different characteristics. And then within those two countries in this case, we vary the values of those factors in order to account for their effects. So in this case, we have two democracies. Uh, the country's stake is high, high stakes. But for example, one different, we have your leader background. So this is a new leader. Remember the expectation was that the new leader would be more resolved. In this case, the leader recently took office, but she has a long career in the military. So in this case, this leader has, uh, uh, has a, a long military experience or should be more resolved than the leader in this case, right? So in this case, the country is an ally. In this case, the country is an adversary. So as you can see, this is the way that a conjoint design uh, varies different factors. And then we can estimate the main question, which is 
if you had to choose between those two countries, A and B, which one of them is more likely to stand firm in a dispute? Which again, ask essentially, which one of those countries is more resolved based on those different factors? That's the idea behind the conjoint design. Uh, okay, so what do they find? As you can see, the main result I write here, very big figure link, which I will just show you because it was a very, it was a very big figure. I didn't want to try and uh, press it into the slide, so it's hard to see. But overall, what you will see in a second is that past behavior and current behavior is are two factors that matter a lot for the way that we assess resolve, as well as different characteristics, whether it is the regime, the stakes, or for the leader itself, the military service. So. Just a second, you get the puppies again. And here, this is the paper, and this is the result. As you can see, the figure is a very big one. And this is one type of uh, figure, which again shows, this is the, uh, the uh, aspect that we measure, the average marginal, marginal component effect of each one of those different factors. And what we see here, for example, is that countries that has high capabilities is seen as more result when it comes to um, when it comes to regime type, so our zero is our uh, uh, comparison. So compared to a dictatorship, democracy is actually seen as less resolved than a dictatorship, which is kind of a different uh, types of, uh, type of, uh, of what we expected. Uh, remember we talked about military service, so long military service, the, the effect here, as you can see, is positive. So long military service is seen as more resolved than a leader which has less military service. It's again, it's the perception of the respondent about the leaders, uh, other leaders. Uh, as we said also about behavior, so those that engage in costly signals such as mobilizing troops are seen as more resolved compared to those who just uh, issue a public threat. So as you can see, there's a lot of type of results, in, a lot of types of results here, which point to the different factors that we take under account when we assess whether the behavior of some leaders are more resolved than others. Okay, I'll just finish up by uh, coming back to this. So we talked about the results and actually that's it. That's additional papers if you wanna read the very interesting type types of paper. Uh, also talking about reputations and resolve and deterrence. And with that, I'm done for today. I hope that this uh, lecture uh, is a uh, not uh, too complex and not too long because of the technical difficulties we have. But again, if you have any questions, any problems, you're more than welcome to come and uh, talk to me during office hours as just send me an email. And with that, I am uh, done for today and I will see you guys on Thursday. See you. <laughs>